Imagine this scenario. A patient is altered, looks sick, blood pressure 80s over 60s. She's placed in the resuscitation bay. Her airway and breathing are intact, but due to the undifferentiated hypotension, you grab the ultrasound transducer and place it on the chest to start the rush exam. But you get this parasternal view. You do some quick probe adjustments, confident that you'll get a good view, but you don't. You feel frustrated. You move to the apical window, still no view. Now you feel that POCUS is overrated and you won't be able to obtain any hemodynamic information from a bedside echo. This lecture will teach you an algorithm to manage the difficult bedside echocardiogram. However, you need to be familiar with the basic cardiac views. If you're not familiar, please see my other video on the basic echo views first, then come back to watch this video. My inspiration for this lecture was this fantastic article that I ran across by Grotberg et al. Why is this article so important? Well, I started to make another lecture about point of care echo and hemodynamics, but if you can't acquire any images, then all the advanced echo education in the world is not helpful. The article mentions many reasons for poor images, including body habitus, dressings or drainage tubes, postoperative sternotomies, invasive mechanical ventilation, the presence of subcutaneous emphysema, or lung hyperinflation due to asthma or COPD. But here is the summary slide for the entire article, and we'll go through most of it. We'll start with the first column labeled body habitus. If you have a patient with large body habitus and difficult sonographic windows, one of the easiest ways to improve your images is to place the patient in the left lateral decubitus position. Here's the typical position, but it's not ideal for echo since there is little to no room for a transducer, especially at the apex of the heart. So the first maneuver I perform on anyone with poor peristernal windows is to place them in the glamour pose. This is essentially a modified left lateral decubitus position and it's ideal for echo. You'll roll the patient partially onto their left side. This brings the heart closer to the chest wall and creates enough room for your transducer to fit at the apex of the heart. In addition, recognize that the left arm is above the head. This will slightly open up the rib spaces to make for a better sonographic window as well. After we roll the patient into the left lateral decubitus or glamour position, we're going to optimize image acquisition during the respiratory cycle. Using the respiratory cycle to your advantage is easier when the patient is mechanically ventilated, but you can do it when the patient is cooperative as well. So for poor peristernal windows, you're going to want to have the patient hold their breath in expiration or use the expiratory hold button on the ventilator. If the patient has poor subcostal windows, you're going to want to have the patient hold their breath on inspiration or use the inspiratory hold button. If both of those two maneuvers don't work to improve your images, then we'll move on to the modified subcostal views. Most of the lecture will discuss these new views. Notice that there are two important ones, the mid-papillary level and the aortic valve RVOT VTI. We are not going to discuss the subcostal bicaval view since it is nearly impossible to obtain in my experience. First off, you may be thinking, what are you talking about? Multiple subcostal views? There's only one subcostal view and it's a four chamber view as seen here. Well, actually there's some additional ones that we'll use. So what you'll want to do is obtain a standard subcostal four chamber view and then rotate the probe on its axis approximately 60 to 90 degrees counterclockwise. The marker should now point to the patient's head or to the patient's left shoulder. And this will obtain a subcostal short axis view. But before we talk about the subcostal short axis views, I wanted to talk about the parasternal short axis views. This can be a difficult concept since people think there's only one parasternal short axis view. In reality, there's actually many, and here are four different examples. Here's a parasternal short axis view located at the level of the aortic valve labeled an A. Then if you move your probe more towards the apex, you'll notice you can get the mitral fish mouth view here. Moving further, further to the apex, you'll get the midventricular level view here. And then finally, you'll get the apical view. These are all parasternal short axis views at different levels of the heart. Here's a comparison between the two short axis views of the heart. Notice in the parasternal short axis view, your RV is going to be on the top left of the screen. But in the subcostal view, the RV moves to the top of the heart or even the top right of the heart. And here is what it looks like actually when you perform the echocardiogram. Notice that the RV is on the top left over here. And the RV is on the top or top right over here with the liver being visible. They're very similar views though. So if you tilt your transducer to point more at the base of the heart, you're going to now see the aortic valve view of the short axis. So on your parasternal short at the aortic valve level, you'll see your right atrium, right ventricle, RVOT, and pulmonary artery. Whereas in the subcostal view, you'll still have your right atrium, 
right ventricle, and now you'll have your pulmonary artery. This is where we're going to focus on for our next slides because blood flow going through here can be measured and determined to be what we call the RVOT. So this was what it looks like in reality here. Again, with the aortic valve in the center, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonic valve, and pulmonary artery. You may be asking yourself, why are we getting these subcostal short axis views? Well, we want to measure the patient's fluid responsiveness and determine their etiology of shock. And if you haven't watched my video on LVOT VTIs, I'll link it here. But the short answer is the LVOT VTI is inaccessible to many ICU patients for the previous reasons, such as mechanical ventilation or hyperinflated lungs. But studies show that the RVOT VTI can be seen in nearly all ICU patients and it correlates well with the LVOT VTI. However, it is about four centimeters less than the LVOT VTI. So we're gonna assume a normal RVOT VTI is greater than 14 centimeters or a normal LVOT VTI is greater than 18 centimeters. But don't use these measurements for cardiac output. This should only be used for serial RVOT VTI measurements for fluid responsiveness or to determine the etiology of the shock. Now that we have a subcostal short axis view at the level of the aortic valve, we'll place color flow Doppler over the RVOT and you'll notice a blue signal indicating blood leaving the heart. At this point, you can place pulse wave Doppler over this blue signal to get the RVOT VTI. Here we see the pulse wave sample gate placed in the RVOT and we activate the pulse wave Doppler and we get a tracing of the RVOT. If you take the integral of this wave right here, you'll get the RVOT VTI of 19 centimeters as seen here. This is definitely higher than normal since it was performed on a healthy individual. The final subcostal view will be the subcostal IVC view. Rotate the probe so that the marker dot is pointed towards the patient's feet. For all you non-emergency medicine people, I realize that this may be the opposite direction of what you learned, but this is how emergency medicine does it. Instead of focusing on the IVC, notice that the RV and tricuspid annulus are visible in this view. You can use M mode through the tricuspid annulus movement to get a surrogate marker for TAPSI. It's called CTAC, Subcostal Echocardiographic Assessment of Tricuspid Annular Kick. Both TAPSI and CTAC measure the longitudinal movement of the RV. However, in the subcostal view, we are not perfectly aligned with the longitudinal movement of the tricuspid annulus, but it's close. So studies show that CTAC is approximately three millimeters less than TAPSI would be. So if you've tried all the above tricks and you still do not have adequate images, you'll move on to the third column, which says inadequate subcostal windows. Now you'll be able to look at the IVC looking through the right mid axillary transhepatic view. If you're unable to get a subcostal IVC view, then move the transducer to the right upper quadrant. This spot is called the right mid-axillary transhepatic view, and it's very similar to the initial view that you'd obtain for the FAST exam. Now, there's a lot of controversy about the IVC measurement and its correlation with CVP and cardiac output, which we won't get into today. But it's safe to assume that if you have a small or flat IVC, then the patient is fluid tolerant and likely fluid responsive. The authors note that you should get a coronal view of the IVC, however, I suggest using a transverse plane just below the hepatic vein entry to the IVC. This removes the problem of the IVC being elliptical. So to summarize, if you have a patient with large body habitus and poor windows, roll them into the left lateral decubitus position or glamour pose, optimize your image acquisition during the respiratory cycle with having them either hold their breath in inhalation or exhalation, then move on to the modified subcostal views, including the mid-papillary view of short axis, short axis aortic valve view where you measure the RVOT VTI, measure their CTAC or their TAPSI corollary, and if all that doesn't work, then measure the IVC in the right mid-axillary transhepatic view. And if none of that works, then there's consideration of TEE. TEE and IV contrast are advanced interventions, and most ED and ICU doctors don't have access to these tools for now. But as costs come down and POCUS advances, they'll gradually make their way into the ED and ICUs, especially resuscitative TEE. Please comment down below if you want me to make a resuscitative TEE lecture.